three, two, one. Skull. Hey, we're live! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. Okay, I hope we haven't had this one before. Why are pirates pirates? I don't know, Lily. Why are pirates pirates? <laughs> because they are. God! <laughs> Can I just say that on The Last of Us, Ellie has a, a pun book, and I would just like to say we did it first. Oh. I mean, the video game came in 2013, but... um. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read media take. The podcast where we analyze and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. yeah. And we're back with another Black Sales episode. Yay. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who checked out our first episode. Finally discussing episode two of season one of Black Sales. Just a bit of background. So Black Sales was a stars show that ran from 2014 to 2017. It was created by Jonathan E. Steinberg and Robert Levine. I'm going to say it might be Levine. I'm sorry about that. And it's set at the end of the golden age of piracy, so in about 1715 onwards. And so we weren't sure whether we would just cover the next episode we thought was interesting, or whether we should jump ahead. And while watching episode two, we actually noticed something we thought was interesting. It dawned on me when one of the crew members points to two paintings and just says, tits, tits, fruit, fruit, saying like it's both got those things in it, and asking what the difference between the two paintings is. And when I first watched this episode, I really hated that line. But this time it kind of reminded me of watching Kunst und Krempel with my parents. Kunst und Krempel is the German version of Antiques Roadshow. And because I as a child would always say, why is this painting worth 5,000 euro and this one is worth 500? <laughs> I just didn't understand the difference. And I realized then that in the episode, there's so many elements in the storytelling about what is worth and what is value and how much is something valuable and to whom. So we're really excited to dive into episode two. Yes. And just as a heads up, here be spoilers. We're kind of <laughs> going into this presuming that you've already seen Black Sails. We'll mainly be sticking to kind of the events of this episode, but we'll definitely be talking about some quite big plot points from later on in the series. So yeah, just a heads up. You've been warned. Yeah. <laughs> And just to sum up what happens in the episode as briefly as I managed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. There's, there's so much happens in this episode. Yeah. yeah go for it. <laughs> so the summary is Captain Flint has framed Singleton as the thief of the missing schedule to find the Spanish treasure of the Orca de Lima, but soon realizes that the new crew member, Silver, is the actual thief. Silver, who has teamed up with Max to sell the page, storms off the ship and into Nassau. Max, meanwhile, is trying to set up a sale with Jack Rackham, who has converted most of his crew's money into pearls to pay for the schedule. And Flint informs Eleanor of the treasure and asks her to partner with him to get it. After Billy and Gates then find out that Anne Bonnie, Jack Rackham, and Charles Vane are the buyers of the missing schedule, they inform Flint, and in turn, Eleanor realizes that Max is the seller and urges her to hand the schedule over. Max asks Eleanor to leave with her, begs, pleads her <laughs> to leave with her, <laughs> and the riches that she will make from the sale. Instead, Eleanor forces Max into confessing when and where the sale will take place, at sundown, Vane and Jack head to the racks to make the deal where they are met with multiple men hired by Silver, who refuses to show his face. However, before the deal can go any further, they are interrupted by Flint and Billy. And to save himself, Silver memorizes the page brilliantly, burns it, and explains <laughs> to Flint that killing him would mean not being able to access the treasure. During the chase to find Silver, Jack falls off of a rock into the sea, <laughs> losing all of the pearls in the process. And in the final shots of the episode, we see Flint ride away from his men and return, quote unquote, home to Miranda, collapsing to the floor. Very nicely done. <sighs> That's, there's so many, you only realize when you're trying to write it all down, there's so many characters doing so many different things. Um, but yeah, very nicely summarized. I think Silver must have looked at the page before that one scene to memorize it all. I don't believe his memory is quite that good. He must have studied it in advance. <laughs> but I think the show wants us to understand that Silver is, because he's meant to be so charming, right? That he's also massively intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a man who can memorize circumstances and dynamics and stuff well, but also literally just facts and figures, apparently. Yeah. By the True. light of a, um, of <laughs> a fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> whilst he's under threat of his life. Yeah. I guess maybe it sort of presents him as someone who works well under pressure in a very yeah, sort of literal, very in like extreme <laughs> sense. Yeah. But yeah. So Lily, pray tell, what is pre-read text? So yes, in this show, we talk about the concept of a pre-read text. This is a term coined by the YouTuber Rowan Ellis, which describes when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. And this phenomenon creates a kind of cultural consciousness of the story, characters, images, concepts, etc. of the text, which might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material and instead all come from adaptations that have come afterwards. And Ellis actually coined this term in a video about black sales, which is actually where the idea for this show came from. But black sales illustrates this idea really brilliantly because it acts as, it's got quite a lot of pre-read text surrounding it. So it acts as a kind of prequel to the book Treasure Islands by Robert Louis Stevenson. It includes some of the same characters such as Billy Bones, Long John Silver. And also it kind of revolves around the same kind of treasure that they're chasing in Treasure Island. But Black Cells also draws on pirate history more generally. So pirates like Anne Bonny, Edward Teach, Calico Jack. And even more so, it draws on many tropes of pirate and treasure hunt stories, many of which Treasure Island itself helped to establish, which we're now going to talk a bit more about. But yeah. (laughs) No, but that's why Black Cells is such a great example of pre-read text and pirates in general, because our understanding of pirates come through stories we haven't necessarily even read. Throughout this episode, we're going to reference Rebecca Simon's book, Why We Love Pirates. And one thing she says about the preconceptions and what we consider pre-read texts about pirates, I'm going to quote here. To my surprise, I found that no source made any mention of eye patches, peg legs, walking the plank, or anything else of the sort. There was one rumor about buried treasure, but that turned out to be false. These tropes did not appear until the 1880s when a man named Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a little book called Treasure Island. But it couldn't just be Treasure Island that created popular interest in pirates, right? Pirates were common subjects in newspapers and other written pieces in the 1700s and early 1800s. So she also acknowledges that this is not only Treasure Island that created this, but also the press coverage and stuff about pirates as well. There Mm. There was a huge demand by the public in these stories about pirates. But I do think it's interesting that what we think about pirates in terms of, like she says, eye patches, peg legs, walking the plank. You recently sent me a Guardian article, which literally referenced walking the plank in the title. Yeah. And again, it's about this idea that's not even none of these things are true, or (laughs) they just aren't as common as we have made them in terms of stories that we consume. Yeah, which is also interesting as we talked about this in our first episode on Black Cells as well, but Black Cells also doesn't go down all these trophy or as many of these trophy things about pirates that weren't true, like the eye patches. Uh, You don't see many eye patches, parrots on shoulders, kind of those stereotypes around pirates. But you do have a lot of buried treasure, which we're going to talk a lot about in this episode. Um, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So when we think about pirate stories, Pusher Island is a great example of pre-read text because it established so many tropes and story beats and conventions that we now recognize in these stories, while most of us have never even read Stevenson's work. And according to Rebecca Simon, a lot of Treasure Island is actually inspired by an actual real-life pirate who was called William Kidd and his legacy. But when you first told me about this, Anna, because you'd read this book before I read any of it, I was like, because I, I couldn't picture William Kidd as a pirate. Like, when you say Captain Kidd, that does ring a few bells for me, but it wasn't something that kind of came, leapt immediately to mind. I was kind of like, do you mean like Billy the Kid, like the cowboy? Like, yeah. <laughs> are we talking about like different outlaws? But no, it's yeah. Captain Kid, as in, yeah, William Kid is in Captain Kid. So, Captain Kid was a kind of infamous pirate who sailed from 1698 to 99, which isn't a particularly long period of time. But he had this huge impact, as Simon argues, on his legacy on pirates further down the line and what people thought of a pirate and what pirates thought pirates were. So he started off working for the British Empire, then became a bit of a loose cannon, attacked too many ships from India and damaged British relations with India. Britain then eventually launched a manhunt for kids, bringing him international fame before he was hanged. And Simon describes him as this exemplary pirate, basically. The thing is, his life and capture and trial inspired so many stories. And there's even songs like sea shanties about him and um, legends of buried treasure, even though there have never really been, according to Simon quote, actual physical evidence of his riches. So, and even as recently as 2015, people tried to gather together to find his treasure. And yeah, and so Simon says, 
So did Kidd have treasure or did he not? And if so, how much? Based on all of this contradictory evidence, how can we ever really know? Regardless, Kidd's fame has lasted longer than most pirates because the press and other popular publications have immortalized the stories about his treasure. So I do think this is super interesting. Like we read up about William Kidd a little bit and it's so wild. His trial was documented and then the just transcriptions mm-hmm. of the trial went out and people bought them so much that they had to reprint them into a second edition really yeah. quickly. <laughs> And yeah, people were really into this story. And so back to wealth and treasure. In Treasure Island, they laid the groundwork for stories for pirates seeking hidden wealth. We all know these stories. Yeah. A really popular example is Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. In this story, they try and regain the pieces of the lost treasure of Hernan Cortez. Is that right? Because the emphasis on the A is like Hernan? I'm not sure. Sorry about that. And I think is this right, Anna, that kind of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise kind of launched this renaissance in pirate media? Before that, there hadn't, it hadn't really worked for quite a long time and people weren't making money out of pirates. And now you kind of see quite a lot more pirate media popping up with like Our Flag Means Death and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. I also saw Kira Knightley and people like that talk about that in interviews that everyone would always laugh when she would say that she was in a pirate movie and that she was in a movie about a theme park ride. <laughs> But there's a Gina Davis movie that's quite famously super um, lost a lot of money because people just thought that a lot of pirate media was outplayed and cliched and kind of like not that interesting. And Pirates of the mm-hmm. Caribbean, as we all know, was a massive success and did create more pirate stories and more pirate movies and media in general. And these tropes and story beats have become so common now that known and, as we say, pre-read, that they appear in <laughs> movies that aren't even about pirates. And so we can see the trope of the treasure map in a lot of kids' stories, such as the famous five. They're often in stories like that. In German media, you have audio plays like Die Drei Fragezeichen, TKKG. It's always groups of kids getting together to solve mysteries or crimes and have adventures. And yeah, you even have a subgenre of this, which is the treasure hunt movies. Yeah. Which I hadn't thought of as a genre before, but now it makes perfect sense. Yeah, right. So these are films like Romancing the Stone or Indiana Jones, which are stories of not specifically about pirates, but it's about often having a kind of treasure or a treasure map and then going on an adventure or a quest to find this treasure. Yeah. Even these movies already try to uh, subvert these tropes, right? Yeah. Even in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, it kind of has this understanding of the genre that it's in. Yeah. Jones says that his profession does not, quote, follow maps to buried treasure and x never ever marks the spot which then still happens in the movie yeah Um. (laughs) (laughs) yeah which is kind of like eating your cake and having it too like you are (laughs) exactly wait is it having your cake and eating it too having your cake and eating it too yeah 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 (laughs) but you're aware of these tropes but also the fact that they work is the fact that they're cliche but also that they work and people find them interesting and fun yeah. Which is really smart in a way. Like, these are outplay cliches, but now let's do it. <laughs> yeah, let's do it anyway. But yeah, so we can see Treasure Island as a kind of blueprint, a pre read text for many tropes that are then used in these treasure hunting stories, yeah. such as the treasure map and this desire for riches and plunder. And these story beats and tropes remain massively popular. And as we've discussed, we've pre read this text through all of this media so much that the original story feels familiar and known to us, despite us never having read Treasure Island at all. Or even like the original, I guess you could also talk about those sort of paraphernalia around pirates from that time period. Not, neither of these things we've necessarily read, but it is so pervasive in pop culture and within our like cultural consciousness. And with that, we want to turn to the page or the schedule and how does this tree reading uh, impact our experience of the episode? An obvious example of how these pirate tropes interact with this episode is this page or schedule. I kept on calling it the page, and I'm not sure whether that's actually what it's called I thought it was episode, pages, to be but, honest. Yeah, but I was re-watching it this morning, and they everyone was calling it the schedule, yeah. I think, mainly. So I, I don't know why I said, started saying page or pages, but I'm going to say, if we say page or schedule or pages... That's what we mean, the we'll missing pages yeah. from <laughs> that would lead Flint and his crew to be able to discover this treasure. That's what we mean when we say yeah. pages or a page or a schedule. Yeah, that silver stole. So this page is essentially the trope of the treasure map. And as an audience, we kind of understand that going into the show, that the X on the map represents the promise of and this unspeakable fortune, enough money to make your dreams come true. But also I think we have that understanding that this idea of this kind of 
unspeakable fortune is also this kind of image of unattainability. And often in these stories, this treasure remains mysterious and we don't necessarily kind of get it at the end. And that's kind of our understanding of Treasure Island and other treasure hunt stories. Even with William Kidd, there were so many different people thinking, is his treasure worth £2,000 or 15000 mm. or 200000 There's so many different sources saying different things. So it yeah. remains mysterious. <laughs> exactly. The romance of it is in its mysteriousness and its unattainability. And then also within the show itself, the page, I'd say in a slightly tenuous way, mm-hmm. is in a sense also a pre-read text. Very few of the characters have actually read it, but they're all invested in what it means to them. And the specifics of like where the treasure is located is kind of in itself unimportant to the treasure's value. They need to know where the treasure is located in order to access it, but really it could be buried anywhere and it doesn't change the value of the treasure. And also I'd argue that it's not even the literal money that the characters are most invested in, although that's obviously a crucial aspect of why the treasure is important. Instead, the page's value comes from the life or the future that that money could buy these characters. So these kind of images, concepts and fantasies that surround the page, the potential that it represents, and this storytelling that creates this imagery which is storytelling, as we'll go on to discuss a bit more, as a central theme of the show as well. And I think that all of this intrinsically links us back to the future of Nassau and the stories that are told about it. That kind of brings us to Nassau's worth. Even in the beginning of the episode, Max says this place is just sand. So Nassau can sort of, like you said, you said something about the romance of it. It can be an investment in the future, but if you just look Mm -hmm. at it, it's sand. It's just a place. And what is Nassau literally, it's just, this is just sand. Yeah. And that's kind of what it is to Max and Silver, because they're not really invested in Nassau at this point yeah. in the show. And then that means that for them, because they're not invested in what this treasure could make Nassau into, for them the page is just something that they can trade for an escape. They have this immediate desire to leave Nassau, so this page for them is worth less than it is for the other characters. They're happy to trade it for some immediate wealth that's still a good amount of wealth, can set them up pretty nicely, but isn't riches beyond your wildest dreams. Because this page for them, the schedule isn't worth as much. They don't care about that future. Yeah. They just care about right now and another more likely potential future for themselves. Yeah. And for Eleanor, for example, this treasure could bring stability to trade in Nassau, which would then mean a future for herself and her power as it is described in the show. Yeah, because she's in the very first scene that we see in this episode. It's her kind of worrying about like Nassau's Im- like future and also just the immediacy of how unstable she is. All of her power comes down to her father kind of acting as this go-between between Empire and like having this connection with Empire, but also with her father n- not coming back to claim Replies. his role as governor. <laughs> exactly. And also the Empire not caring enough about Nassau to come and reclaim it themselves. It's a very patriarchal link to Empire, yeah. and her power is so fragile. But this treasure could bring her the stability that she craves to be able to just like have a place in Nassau that's not so dependent on these other things. And that's kind of the future that she imagines. The schedule then represents the potential of this future. And for Flint as well, this page comes to represent a defence against Empire and the creation of a settlement of reformed pirates, a nation of thieves. <laughs> and we see that in the first episode, he convinces the crew to invest in him and his future as Prince of the World by telling the story of, of this, this future that he imagines them. A great speech. Is a very good speech. (laughs) I keep coming, even though it's not the episode we're talking about, I keep coming back to it. And then in this episode, uh, he convinces Eleanor by literally telling her a story to sell his vision. Yeah. He's like, let me tell you a story. And then talks about this treasure and even invokes the Odyssey to give this idea of what he wants then is, is peace. That's what he's saying, that he wants to bring... He wants to walk away. Yeah, he wants to create a stability in Nassau and then just walk away from it. Yeah. Which feeds into Eleanor's wish for stability for trade. And then it's this idea of this future that will be just calm and will get rid of all this fragility and this risk and danger inherent to Nassau. And so through these stories about Nassau's future and the treasure, the page that could lead them there becomes a symbol that represents the character's hopes for the future of Nassau. And that's all bound up with this concept of storytelling yeah what makes these stories so powerful yeah. which is a huge theme in black sales just lots of people commenting on storytelling yeah i think that's something that rowan ellis talks a lot about in her video essay because so many people were so disappointed by how game of thrones ended and she was like well you want to watch a show that cares about where it started to where it ended and actually picked up all of these elements and kept on theme brilliantly have you seen black sales and game of thrones as we all know actually ended with Tyrion saying, what is more powerful than a good story? Or do you say powerful? I'm not sure anymore. Yeah. But that's why the... Yeah. Yeah. 
it's just you want to groan at that moment because at this point the show has just kind of gone off the rails and doesn't really seem to care about its storytelling and it feels so self-aggrandizing in a really like alt- artificial way um, it feels like a good like moment to like be like hey please give us an emmy what's more powerful yeah. than storytelling oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you're like, well, it's just that, yeah, the writers patting themselves on the back, in, yeah. but like in a very undeserved way. Sorry. <laughs> and also anyone who liked the ending of Game of Thrones, good for you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's, I wish I could have enjoyed it more. Um, but yeah. Anyway, storytelling in Black Cells, both in terms of how the show is told, but also how the stories within Black Cells work is very important, very powerful. And one of the things that this episode highlights is how storytelling makes the characters coordinated. Um, Because if you think about storytelling, it's a kind of social form of communication. With Flint especially, it's it's rhetoric. Rhetoric is a kind of form of storytelling. So again, in episode one, Flint convinces his crew that with this treasure, they will become the prince of the new world. And by doing so, he's uniting them in a vision of the future, which all rests on this symbolic treasure. And what makes this story powerful is how it convinces a full crew of people to invest in the treasure and invest them in this value, making this future more likely to materialise. And this is something that we're going to jump back to later, but I'll just mention it now as well, how Empire controls the colonies and trade through stories as well and controls value. We had that moment in the first episode where they talk about how powerful and important gossip is, for example. Mm. We have different forms of storytelling, like you said. We have the rhetoric, we have the big speeches, we have gossip, which is super important. And then we also have yeah. um, Flint is a great example because he's really good at selling to a big crowd. But then also even when he's with Eleanor and Mr. Uh, Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Mr. Scott, even <laughs> when he's in that room, he's like, let me tell you a story of a Spaniard named Vasquez. He's really good at adjusting to the audience he's talking to, and it doesn't feel fake. We talked about this in the first episode, but being able to deliver, I will make you princess of the new world. You're like, <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I hadn't even thought about that, how they're two very different kinds of storytelling, like from the kind of very showy and spectacular storytelling to the very kind of intimate and sort of like personal storytelling. They're both very big stories do you know what i mean they promise a lot yeah 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 no that's really fascinating but you know something in the storytelling beneath the surface (laughs) yeah no i wanted to highlight this as well because i think on the one hand you have these very big and powerful main narratives that these characters are pushing that create this value in the treasure and that's push people towards these futures but at the same time there are also stories running underneath the surface that have a massive influence on these main stories and by extension on the audience as well. The scene that kind of clued me onto this idea of the power of hidden or absent stories was the one where Eleanor is talking to Mr. Scott and asking him to stay with her and to kind of invest in her story of Nassau, mm-hmm. which brings economic stability and this kind of future where she controls trade. Yeah. It's important to note that Mr. Scott in this moment, he's an enslaved man. And so his choice to stay is quite limited. He'd either stick with Eleanor or choose to go back to Mr. Guthrie or perhaps just abandon them and become a pirate. This idea of choice is within context. However, as we learn much later in the series, Mr. Scott has his own reasons to be invested in Nassau's stability and in Eleanor's power. We find out that he's providing for his family and the rest of the community on the Maroon Island, which relies quite heavily on him being there in Nassau and Nassau having a level of stability. So in this moment when Eleanor's asking him to stay, this story goes untold and it's only later that we can look back at these moments and understand why Scott made the decisions he did to stick with Eleanor and to fight for continuing trade on Nassau. And that's a really powerful and influential story to the overall story of Nassau. And without it, Scott might have made a different decision in that moment. But although this story is marginalised, it's also powerful in its own right. I think understanding that it's not just the main stories that hold power. It's, it's something that this kind of moment highlights to me. However, <laughs> we were debating whether we, are we giving the writers too much credit here? Or is this really something that they planned? That this was the vision at this point already to have yeah. Mr. Scott have all of this backstory? Or Yeah, it's nice how you can look back and read it in this way. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can give them all of the credit for that, though, because I'm not sure that they really knew where they were going with Mr. Scott's character or that they'd plan this far ahead. Like, they were quite good at dropping hints for other characters, but it's like, you can read between the lines, but I feel like you can give more credit maybe to a person watching the show than to the showrunners necessarily. And I think that's a fair point to make as well. (laughs) We could give credit to Hakim Kai Kasim, the actor, that he played in terms of his facial expression, that you can read so much 
just not quite certainty about what is happening in that moment and what kind of choices he can make in the situation he's in. Mm. He's giving a lot of nuance there, which allows us to then retroactively see, oh, this could be about the backstory about his family, or this could just be about the moment right now in terms of his future with Eleanor without. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another example of these hidden stories that massively impact the main story is when we look at Flint. And so Flint tells Eleanor the story of a nation of reformed pirates working the land. But as we learn later, this isn't Flint's vision of the future. This is Thomas's vision and the vision that he, Miranda and Thomas all shared and fought for in London. And it's only when we get to the second season that we learn just how much of Flint's actions are motivated by his loss and the stories that he carries with him. And it goes on to have an even bigger influence later in the show. And I think this is a point where we can pinpoint and say, like, the writers definitely were thinking about this when they wrote all these. This was definitely thought of from the beginning. But it, again, it's sort of this untold story that goes hidden beneath the surface, but then has a massive impact on why Flint's doing what he's doing, the stories he's telling, the kind of actions he's taking, and the sort of overall narrative of Nassau. You can kind of talk about quite a lot of different characters for this as well. But I think these two are quite key examples in this episode, at least. You and I have often talked about how to access different texts and stuff. One thing that you always said to me is that you said that the No Archive is... What did you say? Sorry. No Archive is objective? No Archive is... Yeah, or No Archive is neutral, maybe? Neutral is the way you said. (laughs) Is what you said, yeah. I'm sure I stole that from somewhere. I can't even remember saying that, but I'm sure I stole that from somewhere else. Yeah, and it's something that we talked a bit about in our episode on Our Flag Means Death as well. Episodes. (laughs) Episodes, sorry, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, when we spoke about Our Flag Means Death, we talked about oral histories and written histories and how quite a lot of pirate history has been lost to time because it wasn't written down, it wasn't part of this like official archive of the colony of empire. We talked about how you can find these queer elements of the archive and how that history is often hidden and sort of requires you to read between the lines. Yeah, exactly. And there's something kind of radically queer about existing outside of the archive and these undocumented stories that can sometimes be very powerful in their absence. And it also made me think about this one Tumblr post that I saw that was about kind of trans histories and the gaps in the archive and how often when we see trans histories in the archive it's because people were either outed in life or after death as trans and actually in some ways it was more comforting for the kind of writer of this post that you can think about all the trans people who aren't in like the fact that you can't see someone in an archive in some ways is more comforting thinking about the people who stayed under the radar and are absent from the archive and the safety in being unknown this sort of tension between the main narrative and the underlying narratives But there's something reassuring sometimes about this absence and sort of a safety in absence, while at the same time there is a violence in absence. And there's a weird tension between those two things. But this episode and kind of the hidden histories lying underneath the surface made me think about that. I think that's really beautiful because if we think about how much we fight for representation and we should continue to be critical and all that, but like that line, you cannot be what you cannot see, sort of limits maybe your own perception of that in a weird way. Not that that shouldn't, there should always be criticism put to the powers that be that make decisions to not let people be seen, right? Mm -hmm. But as an individual, I love this idea of going against that and be like, there's beauty in the people who existed because they weren't, like you said, like because they weren't outed. Maybe they were safe. Mm. And it doesn't mean that their lives weren't important within the larger narrative. It's just that yeah, you don't get to see it and we don't get to see it. Yeah. I think it's also interesting because Simon talks about in Why We Love Pirates about how pirates were so beloved because of this aspect of at the time it was so important in society to behave correctly And so they were very drawn, obviously, to stories about people not behaving correctly. And this idea of these communities that were very much not polite. And just so funny that there's so much about pirate tropes that are about violence and just criminality in and of itself. Like we talked about in our first episode, this idea that we have sanitized this pirate thing, but it's still a violent person with a weapon, even if it's a kid's costume, right? That wants to cause havoc or something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things why we're so connected to these tropes as well. Yeah. That we like this idea of going against the grain. Absolutely. And we've lost quite a lot of records around piracy. There is so much room to reimagine those histories as well and think about what could be kind of happening in this place that's like on the edges, on the margins. 
as Lucy said in our episode on our flag means death, the kind of eccentricity, the thing that's decentered, yeah, um, yeah, and kind of what could be happening there and how it impacts on the main, yeah, which is kind of what we see with these stories as well, right? We see these marginalized hidden stories that have a massive impact on the main story, but we just don't see how those things are interconnected, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, which is kind of post-colonial theory as well, I think. Speaking of post-colonial theory, (laughs) so there is a lot that could be said about economics, empire and worth in the show. We're not going to say those things. We're not from an economics background. When we're thinking about themes of value and worth in the show, I was trying to look at Marxist theory and other kinds of theory and trying to figure out how the economic system was working and just breaking my brain. Basically, I think if we'd gone down that route, I think we would have maybe, I would definitely have butchered the theory or it would have been basic in a way that wouldn't have been interesting or particularly useful in analysing this episode. I'm one kind of horrified of a person who studied economics listening to me talk about it and then just ripping their hair out just going like no that's not what that term means because I feel that way a lot of the time when people use feminist terms for certain things I'm like that's not what that is you cannot just look at it from you have to give context and that's what we mean by basic we just didn't want to butcher the language but we are going to talk about value and worth and all that but please bear with us (laughs) we're going to take a little bit more of a literature media studies analytical approach yeah rather than an economics uh, economist's approach yeah we'll be looking at the idea of storytelling and how that relates to investment and worth yes which you've already been talking about yeah but yeah anyway so using anna's example of kunst and krempel and the tits and fruits painting we can see how an item's value and worth is a kind of norm that is agreed upon according to a set of social criteria these criteria aren't necessarily apparent just by looking at something we need to be educated in these criteria or get someone who understands this criteria to value an object for you and that's really evident in this scene, a tits tits fruit fruit scene, and the role of the appraiser. Comedy is you're sort of seeing a general lay person going up against an appraiser who knows about what makes something a masterpiece like valuable. He names the artist. Yeah, it's unmistakable yeah. that it's the work of this guy. This, however, is an abomination. And then you have the lay person who's like, well, they look the same. It's the fucking same. And then the appraiser who's like, well, they may look the same, but actually one of them is very high valued and one of them is very low valued. And obviously, um, the scene is exaggerated, and as audience members, we can see that one is quite skilled and that the other one is a lot less skilled. But at the same time, it also kind of creates this important precedent that value and worth, as it's presented in the show, is not inherent and it's decided by criteria. And in this case, worth is decided by empire and the kind of norms and conventions that run along with empire. So patriarchy, white supremacy, etc. Yeah. And the emperor is the thing that decides the prices that they will pay for pirated goods, for example, like the value of a pearl, which pearls are very important in this episode. If the empire decides that even Nassau is worth it, they will come and reclaim it. They're just kind of busy fighting wars right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's also important because the golden age of piracy is mostly possible because the empires wanted a foothold in those regions. And so because of that, and then they fought wars, again, Rebecca Simon goes into this in her book as well, mm, but like, yeah. because they were fighting wars in Europe, they created this vacuum and that created an opportunity for pirates to swoop in again. And these regions exist as investment value to empires but pirates are also connected to that because the trade creates ships and then those ships you can rob so pirates are invested in the status quo even if they claim that they are against it because they are able to take some of the profits off the empires for themselves while sort of living somewhat outside of its balance yeah it's interesting to think about value and empire and how these two things are interlinked, but also how much piracy relies on the value that empire gives to things to keep going. And so pirates are this enemy of empire, and yet they are also, in their origin and source of income, closely tied to it. And as you were talking about with William Kidd earlier as well, he started off as a captain of the British Empire, but then just went slightly too far. So he started doing his work in a way that wasn't in line with the values of the British Empire, So while he was sort of founded within the British Empire, he then went on to become something else. And then like these two things are very much interlinked. And it's interesting how value and worth kind of highlights this within the show as well. It's almost a Frankenstein origin story. William Mm. Kidd could look to the British Empire and be like, you made me what I am. Like, (laughs) no, because like... It totally is, yeah. (laughs) No, because William Kidd, if you think about a pirate before he was the pirate, William Kidd was just a legal thief. 
He just was yes. stealing for the British Empire. But then because of the thing with India and Indian ships, they sort of took away this legality of what he was doing. And then all yeah. of a sudden he was a pirate. Yeah, Like he considered himself betrayed. He didn't think of himself as, I want to go against the empire. In his mind, they made him do that in the first place. Yeah, he was like given this letter of mark by the British Empire, which sort of allowed, it was sort of like, you are free to kind of do this sort of piracy yeah. stuff and we allow it. And then they like revoke that when they just didn't like what he was doing. Um. <laughs> well, sort of, it went missing, quote unquote. When he was supposed to produce it, it sort of wasn't there anymore, which is kind mm. of, again, mystery. It's like, was he really betrayed? Yeah. Ooh, another piece of paper that sort of yeah. has like so much value <laughs> and worth. And then like, even these things that are written down can be very fragile and go missing. Which again, we talked about in our Flag Means Death episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it when these things cross over. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So pirates are an enemy of the empire and yet also in their origin and source of income, they're still closely tied to it. As a segment, let me attempt this. So William Kidd had a certain value to the empire as a mm. character within the empirical economic system. And now let's shift to talk about characters <laughs> of the show as to their value within the storytelling or to other characters. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, nicely done. That was very smooth. But I mean, it does relate very closely. I think in, in our first episode on Black Cells, we talked about the kind of transactional relationships that characters have with each other. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you see that really clearly in this episode as well. So one of the first moments in the show, which specifically assigns worth to a human being, or mm -hmm. how little they're worth, is a sex worker when Eleanor comes down from spending time with Max. She pays for it, the privilege, quote unquote, to a woman who works at the brothel. And then Eleanor sees the sex worker who was beaten up really badly. And we then find out that this sex worker is decided not to be worth protecting because the client paid a certain amount for her. And so the direct quote is 50 pieces he paid her. That's worth a few nicks to the hole, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And so we know that the sex worker isn't worth a lot in this world to these people. Yeah, she's seen as like, she's objectified and dehumanized in this moment, like nicks to the hole, like she's like a vessel or a boat. And obviously sex work is a form of work and you're not paying for a person, you're paying for a service and like not to view sex workers in this way, but within this episode and within this world, they're being dehumanized in this way, I think is what we're saying. Yeah. Like this is not us talking against sex work in any way, shape or form. We're talking about the disrespect and like you said, the dehumanizing that happens in this moment. Mm. And also the money yeah. doesn't like those 50 pieces are not going to go to her. No. Like she's going to pay like a percentage of that to the brothel. Like she's going to get a bit of that. And she's seen as like a kind of, she's replaceable as yeah. well. She's replaceable as a worker. And so Max similarly is treated as replaceable due to her work as a sex worker. Yeah. Oh my God. Sorry. Can I just say this? Um, because I just forgot this. One of the things that's also important to talk about Max, how replaceable she is, is shown by Vane being so violent towards her mm. in the episode. And yes, she's doing the thing with her hand. We should weighs it off for Silva to like not engage. But still, you're watching a black woman be brutalized really horribly. Mm. And knowing that Vane is very much willing to snap her neck if that's what it takes for him to get the page. Yeah. And I think also the way that this episode treats its black characters as well. You see the disposability that these characters are treated with in this society. Like when Silver is selling the schedule or trying to sell the, the schedule to Vane at the Rex, yeah. And the first man that he sends out in his place is a black man who Vane just instantly kills with not a second of hesitation. And kind of continuing on from the from episode one where very similar things happen to yeah, black yeah, yeah. characters. And it's disposability in the eyes of the characters, but also in the eyes of the script writers and in the eyes of the audience as well in the way these people are treated. Yeah. These people are not going to have a future in the show because we are not given any space for them to exist other than... I mean, mm. Silver is using that old man literally as a shield. Literally. Yeah. He becomes... He's objectified in that sense and is only worthy, not even as a transaction between him and Silver, but as a go-between transaction between him and Vane and yeah. Calico Jack. Yeah. So Max in this world as a black woman just doesn't have the same value within the system. So she can only be worth like whatever her labor can bring her to herself, right? Mm. But within the system, she doesn't, she's treated as replaceable. And even a character like Silver, I feel, doesn't really respect that she still needs to make money. Even in the scene when he goes into her room to talk to her about them selling the page, 
she's with a client. She's making money. She also doesn't want to lose clients down the line if the page thing doesn't mm-hmm. turn out, if the schedule thing doesn't work out. I just love the fact that she just looks at him and just goes like, who do you think you are that you can cost me this money? Like, he's thinking about himself and how much money he can make, but he also doesn't have any respect for her labor, right, in that moment. Mm-hmm. Because this is literally walking into someone's place of work and being like, well, let's just talk about this now. No, you are interrupting yeah. something here. And it also shows, it, again, it's about kind of future and present and who can afford to think about lots of money in the future and who has to think about it right now she's like you know this money is important to her who do you think you are to cost me this money obviously they've got this plan to get this money in the future but she also needs to think about right now whereas silver's sort of already just thinking about the future because he's not living in quite as a dangerous and risky situation as max is because silver is afforded a certain amount of safety to think about the future max just doesn't have that yeah yeah And with that, we wanted to talk about Eleanor, Max's lover slash client slash. (laughs) Yeah. So we want to talk about her because we do think it's really interesting as a character because she is marginalized as a woman in Nassau. Right. And you can see that in the scene in the first episode where she slaps Vane and then Vane very specifically slaps her back. And that scene is so much about power in him situating himself as the man in that situation. Mm -hmm. He makes his gender as opposed to her gender a spectacle for the audience. It's a performance to make sure that he's like, I'm the man I get the last word in. And you know what I mean? When a woman becomes physical with me, I will put her in a place. Whereas Eleanor's power, as we talked about in the first episode, comes more from her position within empire and her position within trade as well. She has like influence and she has imperial power. It's just really interesting because as a woman, she's very much marginalized, right? But as a white woman who's the daughter, specifically because of her family connections, Mr. Guthrie, she very much does still have power within the empire, Mm. weirdly enough, more sometimes over these men in some instances, which is interesting. But like you always pointed out, there's so much instability in that yes yeah as we kind of said earlier as well yeah ellen is very reliant on her father and empire and all of her power comes from basically her connection to her father and his connection to empire it's this very patriarchal i guess like grounding for her however at the same time all of her fragility also comes from that that link to patriarchy and empire and that's why she could kind of always like slightly losing her footing as she can't quite find a place for herself in this world because she's not meant to find a place for herself in this world but she's so invested in it that she just she decides to just try as hard as she can anyway to try and make herself a place within this structure that really doesn't really want her there i think you can read eleanor as because eleanor's kind of new money right like we learn later in the series that her father kind of moved his way up through the ranks and so he's of this merchant class And so she kind of has this chip on her shoulder to prove herself in that way. She doesn't come from old money, even though she does have this strong link to empire. And Mr. Scott points this out as well. When she comes down, he says to her, they're not our friends. They're not our subjects. Subjects are very important, right? Because there's no legal paper telling you these people have to behave when you enter the room, right? So he says, they're not our subjects. They want your father's business. That is the only reason we do not find their knives at our throats. And I think that's super interesting that he is the person reminding her, you're only safe as a means to money for these men. Absolutely. Because again, legally speaking, she's still a woman. Yeah. And I think it's, again, really interesting how the show highlights both Eleanor's sort of privilege and her oppression within the system. And it's easier to analyze this because Eleanor isn't just on her own trying to girl boss this system. You have her also in comparison very specifically with Max. I just I just realized this watching this episode that one of the reasons why it's so important and as much as the Bechtel test gets made fun of. It is important to situate women like that with each other in situations like that and start a show off with a sapphic couple at the beginning makes this so much more interesting because you aren't just constantly trying to defend Eleanor within a patriarchal system. You literally also see how she treats specifically black people like Mr. Scott, but then also how she treats someone like Max right? Because they are lovers when the show starts. So it puts more focus on their dynamic with each other. And you don't constantly have to think about their situation with each other through a patriarchal lens. Not that this still doesn't exist, right? But you can look at them at their intersections and their power imbalance. And that gives just gives Eleanor as a character much more nuance and also shows you a lot of her flaws and her inability to see her own privilege in this whole thing as well. Mm. Yeah. And I, that's one of the reasons I love the fact that this as male gazy as like tits shot, ass shot, this yeah. episode was, was made... <laughs> 
Jesus. Oh yeah, we didn't have mentioned that yet, but yeah. I was like, okay, great, thanks. Um, <laughs> as much as that is part of this episode, I love the fact that they started out the show with lesbian lovers like that, or sapphic lovers, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. And you had a really interesting thought about their dynamic as a sex worker and a client. So this episode ends with Eleanor forcing Max to tell her where the page is and Max is like, we could run away together, come with me. And Eleanor shuts her down and says, no, I'm choosing to stay here in Nassau and I'm choosing to invest myself in Nassau, not in us, not in our relationship. But what I thought was also interesting is the way that this show presents the power dynamic between Max and Eleanor and how Eleanor's like rejection of Max and the way she is able to completely reject her and without even having to say the words like, I reject you or, you know, this is the violence I'm causing you through doing this, is kind of a subversion of this rom-com trope of the sex worker being rescued by the client. And I'm thinking about this particular YouTube video made by Verity Vichy slash Verity Ritchie about the 2022 film Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, which is a film about the relationship between a woman in her 60s and a sex worker. And in the video, Verity talks about the kind of problematic trope of the rescue narrative in rom-coms or stories about sex workers, where, for example, in Pretty Woman, the sex worker is rescued by a rich client who makes her realise that she can be whatever she wants. She doesn't have to be a sex worker and here's a load of money so that can happen. And then in Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, Emma Thompson, who plays the older woman, makes Leo accept himself and is able to come up to his brother as a sex worker or something along, I haven't seen the film, but something along those lines. And these kind of films always are focused on the point of view of the client and especially on the fantasy of being the exceptional client who can act as a saviour towards the sex worker. And so like not to give Black Sails too much praise because I don't think it's necessarily trying to undo a problematic trope and I'm not sure it necessarily succeeds in all ways. But in this particular episode, it's actually Max who is in a way trying to rescue Eleanor from the life of loneliness she sees for her on Nassau. Mm -hmm. Like she says that, you know, your mother's dead, your father left you, everyone's left you, I will never leave you, I love you. This place is just sand, it cannot love you back. I, will, I can love you back. I will never leave it's you. so devastating. And she proposes that they rescue each other almost, like, as equals. She's like, we can go together right now. I will pay for you and we'll be gone together. And she literally, Anna, you pointed this out, that she literally kind of proposes that she's down on her knees and she's like, kind of come with me. All you have to do is say yes. It's just so devastating to watch. Yeah. And it's Max is sending this rescue that she rescue Eleanor, even though she's in a very different position of power, but she's like, let's just go. Let's just leave this place. But Eleanor chooses to exploit her position of power for her own gain. She chooses to stay in Nassau in this very fragile place where she doesn't really, like, it's always going to try and fuck her over every single time. As Mr. Scott has said to her in an earlier scene, like, these people are not our friends. The only reason they haven't slit your throat is because of your connection to your father and empire. She's like, I'd rather be here than away and free with Max. And at the same time as destroying their relationship and destroying Eleanor's own chance of getting away, she also completely destroys Max's ability to get away and puts her in a ton of danger. But she's like, well, I'm going to choose myself and also not even say that I'm doing that. She'll choose herself, but she doesn't want to confront that that's what she's doing. I just love the fact that Max for herself in that moment is like, I'm proposing everything here. A future, you and I together, that's the only thing that matters, right? Yeah. And, and then... Eleanor isn't even able to say the whole thing because like Max points out, say it, like say that you will be happily standing here. Watch them beat the answer out of me. Like Eleanor as a person doesn't even have the freaking any integrity to at least acknowledge that that's what she's doing. And so Max just saying like, say it. The decency almost. Yeah. Yeah. The integrity. The cowardice and not verbalizing her choosing NASA over Max is just so devastating because again, like you said, it's so flipped, but Max has much less power than Eleanor does. And Eleanor is like, I would rather choose a possible powerful position for myself in the future here that isn't certain then, sorry, this sounds so corny, but the love from Max would be certain. She says, I will never ever leave you. I know. And it's so like sad as well, because the other main, one of the other main queer love stories within Black Sails is Flint and Thomas. And I don't know, it's always Nassau that people's relationships crash up against and how much people would give to be with the people they love. And then like Eleanor kind of gives it up to have a shot at, at ruling on Nassau, basically, and being able to like 
be the patriarch essentially i think that's kind of weird to me that one thing i found really interesting because again this show is from 20 2014 to 2017 people always forget how homophobic everything was even like five years ago you know what i mean the show is almost like eight nine years ago now and it just stands there it's watching these two women yeah. just like which completely break apart and he's so focused on his own thing he just wants the page <laughs> and i did think it was interesting the way that the show represented queerness in that sense because mm. none of the people in that room are you know commenting on it mm. i feel like a lot of shows either do the thing where it's so god i hate this but either they really try to position themselves as not homophobic by commenting on two women in love huh and then the other character goes like it's none of your business or something to that line do you know what i mean yeah they yeah, just yeah. don't comment on it because it's not i think it's also much more true to the characters because like billy mm. is i would argue kind of clueless um, yeah. <laughs> and then gates and flint are like no this is about the page like yeah like <laughs> whatever this is is none of our business <laughs> yeah we're like we just don't care <laughs> We just don't care, yeah. This is a small story that's going to get crushed in the main story that we're trying to push. The value is in the page, not in this relationship. And I think with seeing all of these character relationships, it all comes down to this underlying economy of Nassau. Nassau is a trading spot. Like, it is a place that is about transaction. And we see how these ideas of value and worth and transaction underlie all character relationships within the show, especially in the early episodes. <laughs> I just want to circle back to kind of that line that Max says that we've mentioned a few times in this episode that like Nassau is just sand and what that means. Mm -hmm. So besides the schedule, the page and various coins and things that we see in the episode, the other main object of value that we see in this episode or objects are the pearls. Interestingly, a pearl is just a grain of sand that has been lodged in a clam for years, for a long time and which we then assign value to. And I think it's interesting to kind of compare that to Nassau as just sand. All these characters are investing in Nassau. Nassau is full of sand, and they're hoping that some of that sand will become pearls, and that they'll be able to like use that and own that, and then use that in their futures, that they're investing in Nassau becoming a pearl. But as we see at the end of this episode, even these pearls that have all this value, along with the page, are like incredibly ephemeral. Like These objects of value the pearls get churned back into the sea, the page gets burned. It also feels like this like metaphor for the characters' fates on Nassau. Every time they get their hopes up, these hopes slip through their fingers like sands, or like pearls getting dropped into the ocean, pages fed to a flame. Nothing on Nassau is set in stone, nothing is guaranteed. Every investment carries a risk. And so I feel like, yeah, Nassau as this sort of central motif could perhaps be called is nassau itself the treasure island Ooh. could we read nassau itself as treasure island the possible treasure putting that, putting that out there the yeah the potential the maybe a treasure yeah the maybe treasure because that's what this page really leads to isn't it as we've been talking about before the page it leads to the earth the lemur's treasure but that treasure leads back to nassau that's where that page ultimately ends all the characters ultimately end back up at nassau yeah it's also about the fragility that you mentioned. The pearl, everything is so fragile yeah. within that investment. Yeah. yeah. I really like that. Yeah. And I also like that the episode ends with almost a pirate <laughs> trope <laughs> because you end up having Jack falling off of a rock <laughs> yeah. and then losing all of the pearls. Yeah. And yeah. And just, like there is a literally, according to the show, there are just pearls sitting somewhere in Nassau off of the wrecks <laughs> like yeah yeah you just have to die for them but they're lost to the sea it's so interesting because it's spoiler for the end of black sails but you know the treasure remains mysterious the treasure at the end of black sails remains out of reach pearls that get lost in this episode they remain in those waters they get tossed back into the ocean this treasure that's tantalizingly close is always tantalizingly out of reach this success in these dreams they slip through people's fingers like sand um, mm. and it's always the thing that's romantic and interesting about it and I guess is one of the reasons why this story of Treasure Island is so romantic and interesting to people and pirates are so interesting to people is that always this dream and these riches and this fantasy future is always just out of reach and because it's a fantasy that's why it remains interesting to us yeah highly recommend this show also as a rewatch I can tell you like, yeah. there's so many things <laughs> that you will pick up on the second third watch that I did not think i mean i said this as well but when we recorded episode one but i season one is really hard to get through in a way because one there's a lot of stuff that happens a lot of violence that happens which is not mm. fun and easy to watch but there's just so many things like ronella said like that just 
they are planting all of these stories that are then later going to become pearls. So. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I think the pearl is quite a good one because it's a good image of investment, but uncertain investment. And then you might get the investment and then it'll just fall back into the ocean anyway. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, <laughs> these poor characters. Oh, God, this episode is so hard to watch. I feel like the worst part is surely to me just walk- watching Max mm. put all of her hopes and dreams into this person caring for her and then just like... <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, fuck Eleanor. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of buried treasure and hidden <laughs> gems, as always, we do a recommendation at the end of the episode. Hello, this is Lily talking from the 20th of July 2023. We chose to remove the work that Anna recommends in this episode, as the writers of the show are currently on strike with the WGA. We've included links in our show notes for more information on both the WGA and SAG after strikes and why they are so important, and we encourage you to check them out. Thanks for listening, and please enjoy the rest of the episode. So I'm going to recommend a kind of two-part recommendation that I made to Anna before. So I'm recommending the 1986 movie Little Shop of Horrors, directed by Frank Oz and written by Howard Ashman, Roger Corman, and Charles B. Griffith. Yay! But in conjunction with the video essay, the musical that changed Disney, Little Shop of Horrors, by Marlene Bellissimo aka dream sounds on youtube i thought this was really interesting so i watched the i watched the movie back when i was i don't know maybe like 12 or something and didn't really get it i really like the dentist song people who've seen little shop will understand what i mean <laughs> but i didn't really get the rest of it i just thought it was kind of weird and a bit freaky and i didn't understand but watching it again oh boy but the reason i watched it again was because i watched this youtube video and the video like analyzes the influence of Little Shop of Horrors on the Disney Renaissance, which I thought was really interesting, and on musical theatre more generally, and looking particularly at Alan Menken and Howard Ashman and their influence on Disney, and particularly looking at Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. But it was also interesting because it looked at kind of the idea of adaptation and adaptation theory, which is relevant to this show, and I found it really interesting, and how different castings can bring out different themes within the show. It talks about the kind of trans readings of Audrey. MJ Rodriguez was cast as Audrey in the Pasadena Playhouse production of Little Shop of Horrors. And Dream Sounds talks about how this casting of Audrey brings out different themes within the song, like Suddenly Seymour and how casting can change how you watch a show and she also talks about how it can change the story in terms of she's around like whitewashing like how certain productions of little shop haven't included any black or poc characters and how that impacts on the experience of watching the show and the negative impacts of that and she also talked about the translation of musical into german and what you might need to consider when adapting a musical into a different language which I thought was really interesting. And that's one of the reasons I sent it to you, Anna, was I was like, oh my God, it talks about German and adaptation. And let's like, <laughs> let's talk about this. But also just rewatching it as an adult, I'm like, the music is so good. The puppetry is fantastic. And there's just a lot to talk about with it. So I really enjoyed watching that. And I, for some reason, I thought you were going to recommend this. So I came up with a second recommendation, but I don't need to do that now. So it's <laughs> fine. But yeah, I really recommend Little Shop of Horrors and the musical that changed Disney, Little Shop of Horrors on YouTube as well. Those are my recommendations. Well, first, thank you for telling me about the video essay because it was massively interesting. And this is one of those movies that I just never... I mean, I would have not slept if I would have watched that as a child. (laughs) But it is a really fun film. Mm, That's kind of why I was super excited. And when I watched it, I was like, this was so much fun to watch. Like... Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> I think I didn't get how it was like deliberately cheesy when I was younger. I was just a bit like, oh, this is a bit cringe. Whereas now I'm like, oh, it's genius because it's a really well adapted musical into a film. It needs to be slightly over the top, but in a way that works on camera. And I think it does that really well. I just really enjoyed it because there's that one Sarah Zed video about Into the Woods and why the movie adaptation of it just does a disservice to the whole thing because it kind of tries to naturalize quite a lot of the stuff that needs to be quite expressive and theatrical and over the top for it to work and it works on stage but the way they try to adapt it into a film like a naturalistic film just doesn't really work but I think Little Shop of Horrors does a very good job I can't tell you all the reasons why but I think it's just fantastic I love the fact that you said that you love the dentist song then you said something like you all know why or you understand (laughs) what I mean I was like yes and we're all concerned (laughs) (laughs) 
That's a very bizarre song to like as a child. I don't think it. It's just like it's funny. It's oh, it's slapstick. It's over the top, and it's also like. I mean, I wasn't a massive fan of comedy violence when I was younger, but I can see why a lot of kids <laughs> would like it for the comedy because you know he's just going around pulling people's teeth out, and then I, know, I just thought it was it was so funny. It was so fun, and it still is. It holds up. It's hilarious. <laughs> Are you ready for some comedy? <laughs> Sorry. Are Wait, you? are we... Are we are, I, th- I didn't think we were ready, because I thought we needed to do... Tell people to rate us on iTunes, and... We do... We finish with the joke. Oh, we do that first, usually. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. If you enjoyed this episode and enjoy our podcast, it would be great if you could rate and review us on iTunes to kind of help get the word out about our podcast. Also, if you could share an episode, or if you want to get in touch with us, just yeah just give us a buzz on social media as well if you want to send us economics books to read or i just have pirates opinions please yeah if you know about economics economic theory and can tell us some interesting insights about that in terms of in terms of black sales then please let us know but yeah we're always around we are liliana pod on tiktok instagram and twitter so you can find us there it's also where we post clips and teasers for our existing but also most importantly for our upcoming episodes and we are also liliana's pre-read media tech on tumblr so yeah come find us and now finally we are ready for some comedy <laughs> <laughs> Lily, what did the ocean say to the pirate? I don't know, Anna. What did the ocean say to the pirate? Nothing. It just waved. Uh, oh, oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>